This is my way I invite to Allah by perception I and whoever follows me and glory be to God for I am not among the idolaters that's the mushriks. Ya you are lazina amanu ittaqulla wa kunu masradikin O you who believe beware of God and be with those who are truthful. So thank you all ladies and gentlemen for coming uh this week uh, fortunately, last week I wasn't able to do due, due to the family schedule. And since today I have the chance to do a program, so I decided to put in the notification late. Uh, but here we go. I'm here. Thanks to God. Anyways, uh, we are going to talk about understanding the Quran via the Arabic, the clear Arabic language. Uh, let me let me edit something here before I continue. Sorry about that. Refer to Quran. Uh, Quran. The great Quran. And then we have Bush two G nine. Yeah, then we have Islam. Arabic. Yeah. Yeah, Salam uh same Alakatan. Welcome, Salam Alaikum. Uh, I see you all. Yeah, thank you all for coming. <clears throat> so first of all, before I start I'm going to talk about some uh things that we need to pay attention closely when it comes to understanding the Quran and also dealing with the clear Arabic language. Yeah, Salam brother Shahid, you're welcome. Uh, so first of all, when you are dealing with people in general, as we know the Quran is a guidance for mankind. This is a book God has sent to us and to be benefited by mankind in general. Right, and uh, if you take the case of chapter thirty-nine, verse forty-one, where he says, "Inna anza na nas Indeed, we have revealed to you the book, uh, to the book for the people in truth or for mankind in truth. Right. So the the book al kitab is for mankind, and so is the al Quran. Somebody who doesn't understand what I meant will say, "Why?" Why are you saying the Quran is different from the, uh, uh, you know, the Al Kitab? Uh, there are two things combined in the same, you know, in the same thing. Meaning, Al Kitab is the book, and the book contains the judgment of God, which does the Tibiyan and Likulli Shayin. Then the Al Quran can be found in the Al Kitab, whereby it is the reading. So if you go to chapter 56, verse 77 to 78, it says, In Nahu, the Quran al Karim, then he says, Fi Kitab in Maknun. So the Quran, you find it in the Kitab, right? So it gets to a point when we are talking about Al Kitab, we have to reference it to the, the main important issue. Then it gets to a point when we are talking about Al Quran, which is the Tafsil al Kitab. It is the Tafsil of the Al Kitab. Right, so the Quran does the tafsil of the Al Kitab according to chapter 10, verse 37. So, for people who don't know that, you can look that up. Salam, brother Hamza Hussein, you're welcome. You can look it up so that you know you understand how the Al Quran and the Al Kitab work. But of course, you find the Al Quran inside the Al Kitab, you see how it goes. Good <clears throat> now. When you are dealing with people in general, when you are dealing with the masses in general, the people. For instance, if we go to chapter 22 verse 8, let's see what it says. Uh, Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22 verse 8. It says, nas man ilm wala hudan wala kitabin munir. And among the people, even though God has sent us the book, uh, in truth for the people and I send us the, down the Quran 
as a guidance for mankind. Still, among the people, women and nurse, man yujadi lufillahi, there are those who argue about God, concerning God, regarding God, or against God in some in instance. You see, fillahi bigayril ilm, right, without knowledge. <coughs> so they argue about God, bigayril ilm, without knowledge. Salam nas temi dayo. They don't have the knowledge, but you argue. And we can see clearly in chapter 7, verse 33, to say what you do not know about God is haram, is forbidden by God. Chapter 7, verse 33. To speak or to say something about God where you do not know, it is forbidden by God. You understand? So you're clearly going against the commands of God. So you have people who, have, who will actually argue about God without knowledge. They don't have knowledge in what they are saying. They just keep saying, I think, I think God is like this. I think God is a white man. I think God is in the clouds. I think God is, you know, here, there. This is what they keep saying without any proof, without any knowledge. Then God is wala huden. No, no guidance. They don't have guidance. And when we talk about guidance, you can only get guidance from a source, which is a knowledge. If you have knowledge on something, that is how you can have guidance on something. You understand? Meaning, if I want to use a mobile phone, I need to have the knowledge of how to use the mobile phone. The moment I have knowledge of using the mobile phone, I can have guidance in whatever I'm doing on the phone. Because then I know how to use text message. Because I have the knowledge of text message. So I will have the guidance on having how to do text messages. Similarly, if I have knowledge on how to do phone calls, I will have the guidance on, you know, phone calls because then I know how to pick the call, how to end the call and how to, you know, do a conference call and join in and connect and, you know, hang up. So God says, Wala huden, no guidance. Then he says, Wala kitabun munir, because every source of knowledge and guidance must come from a source and which is a written uh, script, whether a book, whether a law, whether an article, wherever it has to, it must have a source, and the source has to be sent back to a book, and not only a book, it has to be an enlightening book, a book which gives you illumination, which brings light to every darkness or every you know dark understanding. So the enlightening book is there purposely to give you knowledge and guidance. You understand so god brought that as a third instance first of all he says you see people arguing about god without knowledge because the knowledge has a source what is knowledge is every is any piece of information that you know and can prove which is factual that is what we call knowledge you understand if you tell me you have knowledge in how to fix computers or you have knowledge in software Mine is just to give you a software or a computer and tell you do this or do that so that I can see. That's the proof that you have knowledge in that aspect. If you tell me you have knowledge in fixing cars and how to fix a car, mine is just to just tell you, okay, I'm giving you a car, fix it for me. That will prove you actually have the knowledge in that aspect. <coughs> you see, so... We have people who argue about God without knowledge, without guidance, and without an enlightening book. They don't have the Kitab al-Munir. And we all know, in, re in this reference point, we are talking about the book of God. Because that is the light. For people who don't know, you go to chapter 4, verse 174, and this is the answer. God is talking to mankind. He says, Ya ayyuan nasu, kad ja'akum burhanun min rabbikum. Then he says, wa anzalna ilaykum. Then he says, Nur and Mubina. You understand? He says, Oh, you mankind. Because the book, remember, the book is a guidance for mankind, and the book is the truth God has sent down to mankind. So now God is talking to mankind because he doesn't want you to go and argue about God when you don't know anything, nor when you don't have guidance, nor when you don't have any enlightening book. You see? So now God has sent down, Islam, Baba said so now God, God is talking to mankind in general, whether you are a, a Christian, you are a Muslim, you are a Mushrik, you are a, a devil, uh, so far as you are a man, part of mankind, whatever you are, God is talking to you. Whether if you are from America, you are from Africa, you are from China, you are part of mankind, he's talking to you. 
So he says, Kadja Akum. Uh, burhanun. When we say Burhanun, this is proof. And not only proof, it's a solid proof. When we, we say uh, uh, Bayina, Bayina is more like an evidence. But when we say proof, proof is more tangible, it's stronger. You understand? Uh, in terms of in terms of, uh, let's say I'm driving and I don't have my driving license and the police should stop me. Police will ask me for a driving license. Now, the driving license I take out to give to the police will show that I have the proof that I have the audacity or the authority to drive or permission to drive. So that is Burhan. Then in the case of Bayina, evidence is just something you, you can, you know, bring to testify on something you, you uh, is being said or addressed as an evidence meaning somebody can be taken to court and then we will ask you to bring it an evidence you understand so that to to ascertain the issue so in terms of the quran quran can represent represent the bayina at the same time it can represent the burhan but representing as a burhan is what god suggests to us in the first place so quran chapter 4 verse 174 god says ya ayu an nas Karja akum burhanun. So he's talking to every type of person you are as a human being. Meaning when we are having an argument concerning God, this is where the facts should come from, from the book of God. So God says he has brought you the proof from him. And he says, wa anzalna ilaykum nuran mubina. You understand? So this is an enlightening book. Kitab munir. Nuran mubin. It's a clear light. It is not only a light. Because I tell you what. We have different types of light. There's a dim light. There's a light which is very bright. There's a light which is, you know, low in, you know, uh, brightness. We have different types of light. So God actually used the word mubina to describe the light he has sent down, which is a clear light. So several times you hear God using the word Quran in mubin or kitab in mubin or lisan in arabi in mubin so that you understand Quran is about clarity. Some people will say, oh, how come I don't understand this? We will get to that, right? Just like a mathematician can tell you mathematics is very easy, but it doesn't mean every dictum and Harry can understand it. Yeah, so I take you to Quran chapter 7 verse 52, and let's see what the Quran entails, why it is a book of knowledge. So God says, وَلَكَدْ ahum." He says, وَلَكَدْ جِيْنَاهُمْ بِكِتَابٍ فَصَّلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ إِلْمْ هُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمِ يُؤْمِنُ so God says, and we have certainly brought them a book, uh, kitabin, a book, which is a masculine pronoun. So the kitab represents a book. Then it says, fasalnahu, which we have, what, elaborated, or we can say detailed. Ala ilm, ala, ala ilm, upon knowledge, by knowledge, with knowledge, or we can say it has been, what, classified by knowledge or upon knowledge then god says hudan as guidance so you can see knowledge and you can see guidance remember i quoted chapter 22 verse 8 where he says among the people are those who argue about god without knowledge without guidance and without an enlightening book and this verse has all these three you understand? So this verse, chapter 7, verse 52, is now telling you, we have certainly brought them a book which has been detailed upon what? Knowledge, guidance, and not only that, mercy, then it says, for people who believe. Assalamu alaikum, brother, so what's it? Uh -huh. So, for people who believe, so it takes a believer, somebody who believes in the words of God to actually understand what God meant by this. So here, God is just helping you to leave your, the, the, the act of ignorance in order not to speak about God what you do not know. He has given you the book which is based on knowledge. Meaning, knowledge, not only knowledge, it comes with guidance. And not only guidance, it is an enlightening book. That can actually bring light to your, uh, your understanding. You understand? So, chapter 7, verse 52 gives us the summary of the issue in chapter 22, verse 8. So, here you are, you have a book from God. Why would you go speaking about God when you don't know something from the book of God? You don't even know what he's saying. You don't know what he said about himself. 
And then you are listening to jumbles of garbages out there lying to you, narrating stories of people who cannot even see or know God. They don't know God. And they don't even know the limit of what God has revealed to his messenger. Quran chapter 9 verse 97. Right? It tells you they don't even know the limits. Eh? They don't know the limits of what God has revealed to his messenger. And then you'll be wasting your time upholding these narrations eh? with the authority not coming from God. The authorities they have, they will tell you uh, 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 um, based on the authority of Abu Dizis, Abu Soso and so, or Abu Huraira or Nana Aisha, based on the authority of Ibn Zur, Ibn this, Ibn this. This is all garbages. They are all garbages. But you don't get it. Good. So then, in order to understand the book is coming from God and is based on uh, knowledge from God, I take you to chapter 4, verse 166, where it clearly says, لَكِنِ اللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ بِمَا أَنزَلَ إِلَيْكَ أَنزَلَهُ بِإِلْمِهِ then he says, Wal malaikatu yashadun. Then he says, Wakafa billahi shahida. He says, however, God bears witness to what he has revealed to you, Muhammad. He revealed it or he sent it down with his knowledge. He sent the book down with his knowledge. Because I am sure about the lie. I know myself. I know who I am. So if I sit on a camera, or if I meet you face to face and I have to describe who I am, I will only describe who I am based on my knowledge to you. So that when you go somewhere to speak about me, you will only speak what I have told you concerning me. I cannot say, hey, this is me, Shaib Abdullah. I have, I'm married with two kids. And then you go somewhere and say, Shaib Abdullah is single and he has no kids. It doesn't mean you know me. Because then you are not speaking with knowledge on, about me, you see. You're welcome. You see, so God says, Laken in Lahu Yashadu Bima Anzala Ilaika. However, God bears witness to what He has revealed to you. Ilaika is a second person pronoun, which is a masculine attribute. Ilaika talking to the Prophet. So Anzala who be ilmihi, He has revealed it or sent it down with His knowledge, with the knowledge of God. The Quran contains the knowledge of God. It is not the knowledge of so so and so or Abu so so and so or Abu Huraira or you know, understand some garbage they keep telling you. No, it is not from that. So, Walumala Ikatu, Yesh Hadu. And the angels, they bear witness because they are with God. So, they bear witness to what God has revealed with this knowledge. And guess what? The, God sends the Quran through the angel to bring, to bring it down. Because Surah to, uh, chapter 97 clearly tells that. Chapter 97, Surah Al-Qadr. Inna anzannahu fi laylat al-Qadr. Wa ma adhra kama laylat al-Qadr. Laylat al-Qadr khayrun min alf shahr. Then he says, Tananzalu al-malaikatu wa ruhu fiha bi izni rabbi min kulli amr. Salamun hiya hatta matlai al-fajr. We understand. So, it is the angels, they already, they bear witness to what God has revealed because it's based on the knowledge of God. And they only came down with the permission or the, uh, the, the command of God. Right? So now, then God says, So God is sufficient as a witness. Because God, even though the angels know and bear witness, God doesn't need them. He doesn't need them to bear witness to that. But he is only telling us in the book. So that we can know that the angels are aware of the knowledge of God that he brought to us. Now, so when we go to Quran chapter 55, verse 1 to verse 4, it is going to now place the emphasis uh, salam, uh, brother Alex. Peace. God is going to place the emphasis by telling us what the book, the Quran entails and what, what God has to do for us, the human beings. Because it's based on the knowledge of God. So, in knowledge of God, God says among the people are those who argue about God without knowledge, without guidance, and without an enlightening book. So, meaning, if I have a book from God, which is based on knowledge, according to chapter 7, verse 52, and I should study this book, Meaning, I will have the knowledge God wants me to have. So let's check how it goes. Quran chapter 55, verse 1 to verse 4. It says, Ar Rahman. If you don't know who Ar Rahman is, it is the gracious. That is God. 
the gracious. Then he says, Allama al Quran. He taught the Quran, or we can say he teaches the Quran. <coughs> or we can say the teacher of the Quran. Then he says, Khalaq al Insani. He creates the human being. Or he created the human being. Then now the interesting part comes. Allamahul Bayan. He teaches the human being what? The declaration. Or we can say elucidation. He is the one who teaches the human being that thing. Or he taught the human being such. Yeah, salam, Baba Mando. Uh, salam, Prantaru, Aganka, salam. Uh -huh. So, Allamahul Bayan. And we can know what the bayan is. If you want to know what the bayan is, go to chapter 3, verse 138. Chapter 3, Surah Al-Imran, verse 138, where God says, Haza bayanun linnas. You can see, God is not limiting it to say this is a bayan for the Arabs, or for Chinese, or for Africans, or anybody. Linnas, mankind. Right? So he says, Haza bayanun linnas. Then he says, Wahudan wa mawizatun. So he says, this is declaration. This is elucidation. This is explanation. This is clarification. Translate it anyhow you want. But that is the bayan. You understand? So he teaches the human being. He will teach you the bayan. It is for him. The Quran is for him. So if the Quran represents al-Burhan, God will teach you that. If you represent al-Bayan, he will teach you that. If he represents a zikr, he will teach you that. If he re represents al hikmah, he will teach you that. If he represents al hukma, he will teach you that. So be rest assured. So then he says, Haza bayanun nas. So we can see where the bayan is. It's, it's in the Quran. And when we say Haza in Arabic, it means this, something in front of you. This. So you have opened the Quran, and the Quran is telling you, this is bayan. What is the argument again? Unless you are a fool. So now we go back to chapter 55, verse 1 to verse 4. So Ar-Rahman, Allama al-Quran, he teaches the Quran, he, he even taught the Prophet Muhammad, the Quran. And he is the same God who will teach you and I the Quran again. But then there's a barrier on how God will teach you the Quran. And I'll be coming to that so that we can understand. Allama al-Quran, khalaq al-insan, Allama al-bayan. So he teaches the human being the elucidation. The word al-bayan has um, is a marifa, which is a definite article in Arabic. In English, that is definite article. So whenever the word the is put in front of a noun, it becomes what? A specificity of a reference or of reference, which gives you that the actual action being explained to be a noun is something which is definite that God does or is telling you about. So, Allamahul, then he says, Al Bayan. You see the declaration. So, now we see in context the declaration has to do with the Al Quran. Right? Good. So, now we move on to another verse just to see the notion here. So, how are we supposed to get the knowledge of the Quran? Through who and how? Well, as, as far as the Quran is confirmed, uh, concerned, eh, salam, uh, Raski, Kobi, Aganka, bro. As far as the Quran is concerned, chapter 20, verse 114, it says, Then he says, Wala, ah, ta'ajal bil Qur'ani min qabli an yukda ilayka wahyuhu. Then he says, Wa kurra bizzirini iliman. Now he's talking to the human being he created. He, God, created this human being in this verse. And who is that human being? That is Muhammad alayhi salam. Right? So God is talking to him. So God says, فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ مَلَكَ الْحَقِّ So exalted is what? God, the God, the king, Malikul al-Haqq, the truth. Then it says, وَلَا تَعَجَلْ تَعَجَلْ When we say تَعَجَلْ, it's like ajal, to hasten. Uh, ajala, to hurry, to hasten. So, وَلَا تَعَجَلْ Bil Qur'ani, do not hasten with the Qur'an to rush. Because why will you rush when the teacher is, is still alive? He can teach you. But we are going to see how he's going to teach you. So do you not hasten with the Qur'an. When we say the Al-Qur'an, it means the reading. The reading, right? Then it says, Min Qabl, huh? before, huh? and uh, and. Yukda ilayka wahyuhu. 
before it's what inspiration when you say wahyu ah huh? wahi it is inspiration to be inspired right by god just like god has inspired a human being to create to invent an aeroplane god inspired the human being to invent a mobile phone god inspired noah to create the ship god inspired abraham to raise up the foundations of the earth kaaba huh? god can inspire you to come with a certain invention that people have no idea what that is ever you understand so now god says and yukda ilayta wa yuhu so now based on the quran because we know it was revealed to prophet muhammad according to chapter 20 verse 2 to verse 3 ma anzalna alayka alquran litashqa illa tazkiratan liman yakhsha we did not reveal the quran to you in order to distress or to suffer except to serve as a reminder for whoever fears and this khasha is talking about in terms of uh, having awareness for god or respect for god you see so now chapter 20 verse 114 then god gave us the clue or how to get the inspiration of the quran then he says tell god wa qur rabbi zidni ilma and say lord increase me in knowledge because he is the teacher of the quran ar rahman allam al quran he so he has the knowledge of that so he can now teach you similarly because i have the knowledge of the quran right now i can teach people also who don't know that god has taught me so it is the teaching of god that can be transferred to other people because he has taught you similarly if god uh, isa uh, sorry no alayhi salam prophet no was taught how to to build a ship he can now teach somebody else how to build a ship if the first human being created who invented the aeroplane he can now also teach somebody else how to make the aeroplane so this is our inspiration of god work among us and it keeps going so now for understanding this concept that it takes the inspiration of god to actually fulfill the elaboration or clarification or elucidation to the people because you have to declare it's a declaration so you have to declare what god has taught you you don't let it stay with you it is not for you in the first place it is the book of god so you have to give it to the people because that is the purpose of the book is for mankind so god cautioned us with this instance chapter 2 verse 159 god says inna allazina yaktumuna ma anzalna min albayyinat wal huda min ba'di ma bayyannahu lin nas fi al kitab ulaika yal'anumullah wa yal'anumul la'inun god says indeed those who conceal the word yaktumuna comes from the root word katama meaning to hide something to conceal something salam sister christina ya la long time aha uh -huh. to, to hide something to conceal so god is speaking in a plural sense jamu he says indeed those who conceal ma anzalna min al bayyinat what we have revealed of the what clear proofs or we can say uh, uh, evidences right or of the proofs then he says wal huda and the guidance which we all know where the guidance can be found quran chapter 45 verse 11 where god says haza hudan he says this is guidance <coughs> then he said min ba'di ma bayyanahu lin nas the god used the word who who is a masculine pronoun in arabic we say dhamir and he's talking about a masculine attribute because he mentioned a noun prior to that so somebody who say what is the noun here what is the noun being referred he mentioned the huda he mentioned the alkitab and we are going to see it then he says linas fil kitab the alkitab has a masculine attribute al huda has a masculine attribute you, you see here so here is talking about the guidance of god and chapter 2 verse 2 clearly tells you zalik al kitabu la rayb fihi hudan lil muttaqin so you have the masculine attribute there kitab is a masculine word hudan is a masculine word you understand so zalik al kitabu la rayb fihi hudan lil muttaqin aha but when it comes to the word min al bayyinat or bin al bayyinat or bayyinat that is a feminine attribute it is not referring to that it is now referring to wal huda min ba'di ma bayyanahu 
Linas. Then he says, Fili Kitab. So we have people who actually know what the Quran is saying. So what they do is they, they hide it. They conceal what God is saying. They know it. They, God has actually, they are human beings. So God has taught them the declaration of the Quran. They know what they have to declare to the people. They don't. So when we say declaration, it's just like when somebody is traveling. Let's say you are traveling overseas and you have something in your luggages, your bags. You know, you, usually the customs will give you a form to fill a declaration form. You need to declare. Declare means don't hide what you have. Bring it out. So God has actually taught the human being the declaration, meaning don't hide the words of God. Bring it out for the people. God has already done the clarification. Yours is just to manifest it. Don't hide it when you know, because he will teach you. The same way he taught Prophet Muhammad among the Arabs, and he pushed him to go and teach the people. If he chooses you and teaches you, you don't hide the declaration, you bring it out to the people. Because you'll be held accountable for it. Thank you very much, Baba Amando. So here we can see in chapter 2, verse 159, God is warning us. Then he says, Ulaika yala anumuhullah. Those are the ones, the ones who conceal what God has made clear in the book. God has cursed them. Now, the curse of God is even enough. <laughs> if, if you are told, God, uh, alayka, the curse of God be upon you, it is even enough. Because even if I should curse you, it carries no weight. But what did God place the emphasis? He further placed the emphasis what he says, Those who are cursing will curse you. Why? I give an example. Let's say your family is in need of food to eat. And you have money with you, but you are concealing it. And then your kids or your family relatives start dying one by one. And then, voila, all of a the sudden they realize, oh, man, you had money and you are hiding it. What do you think will happen? All the curses, you deserve it. They will curse you. It's obvious. They will be cursing you till day and, day and night. But now imagine only God, only God cursing you. Is it not enough? It's enough. <laughs> you understand? But God is just placing the emphasis how it hurts. And later on you realize these so-called scholars you are venerating have been hiding things away from you without teaching you what exactly what the book says. We have all been to Madrasa. I've been to Madrasa back in my country. They will only teach you how to recite the Quran, teach you Tajweed, teach you how to do, become an Hafiz. But these are all useless. Because they don't teach you the essence of the message. They don't teach you how to understand the message. So what do you expect me? I would rather curse them. Somebody says, why are you cursing them? Because I paid for it. It wasn't free. I paid to be taught. Just like when you come to my market, you buy food from me, you deserve a quality product. If you come to me and I conceal the deed and I wipe the deed out and I sell a bad stuff for you and you later on realize I actually sold a crap to you, what will you do? Will you praise me for it? <laughs> okay, let's move on. So now we can see Yeah, salam uh, we can see the evidences concerning the knowledge of the Quran and how we need to use like this. But guess what? You call on God to increase you increase you in knowledge. What as a human being you don't need to do is stated clearly in chapter 17, verse 36. Let's see what God says. Quran chapter 17, verse 36. It says, Then he says, He says, Do not pursue the word kafu. Uh, the word kafa or kafu. It is like to pursue, to follow. And when we say follow, we are not talking about taba'a, like to follow, taba'a, or tabi'in, those who are following order. No, we are not talking about that. When we say uh, kafa or takfu here, we, are, we mean, it means to pursue something. And we all know what it takes to pursue something. Let's say I'm pursuing a course. I want to become a doctor. So I'm pursuing a, a course. Or I'm pursuing, uh, you know, my pursuit it's like a pursuit you are pursuing to in, in order to 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 become something because you are you are taking up uh what example let me see if i can give some example uh here <clears throat> okay let, let's say let's say we are going to build a house I don't know how to build a house, but I just join a group and I'm pursuing what they are doing and I want to also, you know, partake in it. You understand? 
God says don't do that. Don't be that kind of person. Don't be part of those kind of people at all, at all, at all. Mm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yasim al Katan, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So do not, it means, it means do not cut out or participate in an activity when you, have, when you are ignorant in it. So this verse summarized the whole concept. And guess what? That is my, my, that is, how will I say? That is my best verse in the Quran. This verse. For people who know me, they will tell you about this. But this is my favorite, most favorite verse ever in the verse. It doesn't mean I don't follow other verses in the Quran, no. But this is my best verse in the Quran. Because you can implement this wisdom in every aspect of life you are in. Do you know why God says when an immoral brings you a news? You have to investigate it. It all has to be with knowledge. Don't pursue just because they brought you information. You, you get up like a sheep and follow. Don't pursue just because they told you vaccines will save your life and then you get up. Oh, yeah. Give me, give me. Two, two. Then you're gone. Don't do that, please. Investigate. Reason. Ask questions. Try to know before you take a step. You understand? So this verse, takafu Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge about. If you don't have knowledge, stay away. May it be you are being lied to. May it be you are being put, uh, you know, driven to danger. You don't know. So you need to investigate. And it clearly summarizes this in chapter 2, verse 170. God says, Wa is Kalu alayhi aba ana. Then God says, Awa law kana aba uhum. Laya kiluna shayan walaya tadun. And when they are told, follow what God has revealed. They say, Kalu bal in fact, not tabi u ma alfaina alayhi aba ana. Ah? Bal in fact, we all, we follow what we found our fathers upon. Then God says, What if their fathers, Laya Kiluna Shay, and did not comprehend or understand or reason with anything or reason at all? Walaya Tadun, nor were they guided. What if? You see how knowledge plays a role here. You need to investigate and know. What are they actually doing? You cannot just go to a bus stop just because you saw people standing and waiting and you think you assumed you are waiting for the same bus you are waiting for. That is stupidity. Find out why they are standing there. Ask them. Excuse me. Uh, are you waiting for bus number two? They will tell you no. Uh, then you go and check your own timetable. You see, oh, okay, mine is coming two minutes. That's it. Stop following the crowd. Don't care about what other people are doing. Do you see how it works? Don't just get up and say, oh, mashallah, I was born a Muslim. Don't lie to yourself. Who told you you are born a Muslim? <laughs> you have to get up and strive to achieve. <laughs> there is nothing like an easy catch. Do you know the house Abraham was born? The house of idol worshippers. Did God classify him as an idol worshipper? No, because as a child you are ignorant. You don't know your left, you don't know your right. Following your parents doesn't mean you are guided. It is after you have attained maturity. You know the difference between wrong from right. Then now God will hold you accountable because you are sound. You know what is black, you know what is blue. You know what is right, you know what is right, and you know what is wrong. He created you, so he knows what you are capable of. So I give an example. If you go to chapter nine, verse seven, chapter ninety-one, verse seven to verse ten, I'm going to tell you something. God says, "Wanafsin wama sawaha." Then he says, "Falhamaha fujuraha watakuwaha." Then he says, "Kad afla man zakaha wa kad khaba man dasaa." So God is saying, the soul and what or who proportioned it, who formed it. Then he says, falhamaha. This word alhamaha is what we call ilham. Ilham is like a, a form of inspiration. But it is different from saying wahyu or why. So this ilham, every human being has been giving ilham. And how does ilham work? God says, falhamaha fujuraha. This nafs you have, your soul, it knows what is immoral 
and it is no he knows what is right takwa he knows that what is pious uh, a pious act and it knows what is what uh you know uh how would i say uh fujuraha fajara meaning to to be immoral it knows your soul knows this so this is why don't be surprised when you know your kids already know when they act wrong they know and when they act right they know don't be surprised about that it's the soul the soul already knows this but as a human being the human being can be ignorant based on the environment you are born because you don't know anything and you need to learn from other people but then when it comes to the soul then god says Kad aflaha man zakaha. whoever purifies it has what succeeded you'll be successful then he says wakadhaba mandasaha whoever fails it huh? you 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 cause stress to it you make it fail then you are failed you have distressing your soul which issues you fail right yeah thank you shahad mahmoud uh, Uh, Shohag Mahmud, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Yes, I, I can explain that. Uh, let me see. Hey, salam, uh, Razak. Naganka, salam, Abdul Razak. Sanazwa. Hey, salam, Alaji, uh, Alaji Musa Laminu. Yeah, I see you. Long time, bro. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So, to understand how the soul works, right? Your nafs. Your nafs knows what is evil and what is good. Your soul already knows that. You understand? So this is why when human beings, we do evil, we know. Within ourselves, we know. But then we cannot hide it from God because he, he gave you the soul. So he's connected to your soul. He, he's more closer to you than your juggler vein. So he can he detects everything. It's just like a sensor. You understand? When you go to the shop to steal, there's a sensor. The moment you put the, the, the stuff in your pocket, the sensor, bing, 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 it knows you. You see how it works. Yeah, salam, uh, hamdu, shak. Okay, so let, let, let me not deviate from the topic. Um, God willing, I might come to that, uh, brother, brother Shohag uh, Mahmoud. You ask a question. I'll come to that, inshallah. So we can see in Quran chapter 17, verse 30, it says, God says, Wala alay Then he says, Inna sama wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ulaike kena anhu mas'ula. Indeed, the hearing, when we say hearing, it is talking about your uzun. Huh? The azan. Your ear azan, uh, uh, your azan here, your ears, you are using it to, for the hearing. But this is actually the organ whilst you have the senses inside for hearing. So somebody can have ears, but he cannot hear. So just having this doesn't mean you can actually hear if the senses is not activated. Do you see how it works? Somebody can have two eyes looking like this, but he can never see because the senses are blind. Then somebody can actually have the mind, which is the heart, but the mind is not working. No. Do you understand? Good. So it says, indeed, the hearing, the eyesight, and the mind, or some people will say heart, all those are, are accountable thereof, or will be accountable, or questionable thereof. The word mas'ula means to be questioned, or to be held accountable. So God didn't give you all this in vain. He gave you to be, to be grateful. And if I remember pretty well, Quran chapter 16, chapter 16, verse uh, 78. Yes. Yes, it says, God brought you out of the bellies of your mothers, knowing nothing. He brought you out of the bellies of your mothers, you the human being, knowing nothing. Then he says, ala lakumul sama'a wal basara. Well, uh, then he says, La tashkurun. So then, what did he make? Then he made for you the hearing, the eyesight, and the what? Mind. Or oh, some people who say the hearts. But I don't see it as an organ. Because this is how the senses God is mentioning. Right? When we say the organ, it is the kalb or kulub in plural form. That is the hearts. 
So la'allakum tashkurun, so that you will be thankful, grateful. And guess what? The, the, the promise the devil made to God is that most of the people will not be grateful. According to chapter 7 verse 16 to what? To 18. You see the evidence there. Chapter 7 verse 16 to 18. The evidence is clearly there. The devil will make sure you are not a grateful person. Yeah. So now we move on. So I take you to Quran chapter 6 verse 105. The reason why God is saying do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Because it's very relevant. Don't be stupid. When you, are, you just get up, you see people doing things and they, oh, I, that is how I saw my parents doing it. So I do it. What if your parents are fools? Excuse me to say. What if they are? Do you actually investigate to see whether they know what they are doing? <laughs> you understand? You don't just go up and follow something blindly. Ask questions, reason. And this is why kids in the Western world are smarter. Because they have been given the privilege to ask the parents questions, to reason. You understand? It doesn't make it doesn't mean African kids are stupid. No, neither does it mean third world countries are stupid. But we restrict people. If you are grow, if you grow up in the third world countries, what you end up seeing is your parents enforcing you to follow their beliefs or restricting you, giving you orders you have no choice. Which, in actual sense, according to God, shouldn't work in that way. Unless if your kids are doing wrong, yes, you can straighten them. But give kids chance to ask questions in order to learn. Because the more you are asking relevant questions, the more you learn. You see how it goes. <clears throat> so Quran chapter 6 verse 105. God says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُسَرِّفُ لَآيَاتِ وَلِيَقُولُوا دَرَسْتَ وَلِنُبَيِّنَهُ لِقَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ Then God says, likewise, when we say kazalika, it means like this or like that or likewise. Kazalika nusarrifu, this word sarf. This is what the scholars use and say tasrif or sorf or whatever. So God has done the verses in such a way that he has conducted it in such a way that there are the verses. Rasta, So that people who may say or they will say you have studied because if I, do, I have not studied I can't do what I'm doing right now. I cannot be going into the Quran to pick up verses and explain things. So now they will say you he has actually studied. Wow. This guy has said it because if I quote the references, you can open the Quran from your side and check. Or oh, is Brother Shaib saying the truth? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What he said is there. I see it. This is how you know I've studied. I don't need to go and bring you my certificate that I've gone to Azhar, Jamir, or in Medina, University of this. It's all useless. If it was relevant, the Prophet would have built a biggest university in the world. Ask the Arabs. Do they have any university built by the Prophet? No. Because we still have God. He is the teacher of the Quran. Why waste your time thinking about somebody who has to go to Azhar, Medina, Mecca to learn this, to learn that? He will end up lying to you and lead you to hell. Have you investigated what he's telling you? Or you are only interested in his certificate? Think twice. So then he says, وَلُنُبَيِّنَهُ لِقَوْمِ alamun." So God used the masculine pronoun here. Somebody will say, why did God say, وَكَذَلِكَ uh, نُسَرِّفُ ayati?" And now he went further to say, وَلِيُبَيِّنَهُ He could have used, وَلِيُبَيِّنَهَا uh, or something, يُبَيِّنِهَا But then, the reference of the who is referring to the book, or the what? The Quran. Because the verses can be found in the Quran or the Al-Kitab. So the who here denotes what? The Quran or the Al-Kitab. So, God has done the sort of, of the ayat, the verses we are reading, in order for people to say, you have studied. Studied what? The book. That's where the verses are. So, then God says, Then we will now clarify it. The book. That's why he told the prophet to shut up. لا تحرك به لسانك لتأجل به. إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمَعَهُ وَقُرْآنَهُ فَإِذَا قَرْآنَهُ فَاتَّبِعُ قُرْآنَ then he says, Thumma inna alayna bayanahu. He didn't say, Thumma inna alayka bayanahu. He never told the prophet to do the bayan. God is the one to do the bayanahu. So use your reasoning carefully. So then God says, so that we may clarify it for people who know. So you see how knowledge plays a role here. People who know means they are not ignorant, they are not stupid, they are not foolish, like sheep following the mazhab of scholars and saying, Oh, Imam Maliki will explain this for me. He no. No. 
Good. So I'll tell you the barrier between us and the Quran and why people are finding it difficult to understand the, the, these notions in the Quran. I'll be coming to that. Right? Now, so we go to Quran chapter 41 verse 3. Quran chapter 41 verse 3. It says, Kitabun fusilat ayatuhu Quranan Arabiyan likawmin yalamun. It says, A book whose verses, ayatuhu, whose verses, ayatuhu, you can see the, the word kitabun is a noun, right? Now, it's an indefinite noun used here, right? And it has the word, raf'un. That is why it says kitabun. Uh, that is the raf'un. So, this raf'un here, it denotes the who you are seeing. Ayatuhu is referencing to the book. Kitabun. The book. So that is a masculine pronoun addressing the book, which has been what? Detailed. Fusilat. Because the ayat is a feminine attribute. So fusilat ayatuhu Quranan Arabian likomin yalamun. So we have Arabian, which has the nazbun, and we have uh, we have Quranan, which has the Nazbun, and we have Arabian, which has the Nazbun as well. Then we have Li Kaumin Yalamun, which we have the what? Harful Jar, which is the Ila or Li going to. So then it changes. It becomes Kaumin, then it says Yalamun. So now, for people who don't understand it, you say, what is Brother Shaib doing here? Now I'm telling you the grammatical aspect. Of the barrier between you and the Quran, if you don't understand Arabic, because this is what language, the role language plays here. So this is why you can be reading translations, and mashallah, God can give you the sincerity and purity to come closer to the words of God. But you need to make extra effort to understand what the grammar contains, because guess what? When you leave it to scholars alone. This is where they will do what God says in chapter 2, verse 159, and chapter 3, verse 78. وَإِنَّ مِنْهُمْ لَفَرِيكًا يَلْؤُونَ أَلِسِنَتَهُمْ بِالْكِتَابِ لِتَعْسَبُوهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَكُولُونَ هُوَ مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَيَكُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ لِكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Among them are those who twist uh, the book with their tongues to make you think it is from the book. While it is not from book. And they say it is from God. While it is not from God. And they say a lie about God while they know. But the reason why they will keep saying a lie. Because you didn't study. You keep staying and listening to them. And saying, MashaAllah. 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 In the day of the judgment, God is going to kick your ass. Yeah. Yeah, salam. Daron J. Halim. You're welcome. Hey, Alaj Africa. Nagan ka salam. Bro. Uh, Agali Faisal Nagan Kasalam. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on. So we can see clearly in chapter 41, verse 3, Kitabun Fusilat Ayatuhu Quran and Arabian Likaumin Yalamun. A book whose verses have been what? Detailed, or we can say elaborated, Quran and reading, Arabian, Arabic. Which is Arabic reading. Then it says li for or to. So we can say for kaumin a people yalamun who know. So knowledge plays a role here. If you don't have knowledge, there's no way you can see the detail, the detailing of the Quran. Neither can you see the elaboration. If you don't have knowledge, according to Quran chapter 6 verse 105, there's no way you can know God has actually clarified his own verses. And this is why the ignorant people will say, Ahi, you cannot understand the Quran without the Hadith. And usually it's coming from the ignorant ones. Ask them, do they know the Quran? Yes. And if they say yes, let them find me, Brother Shrine Abdullah. Let's have a seat. Let's cross check if they actually know the Quran. We can come to the conclusion there. Now, so we finish with that evidence. Then we go to chapter 11, verse 1. Now, this verse also is very interesting. I'm going to sh tell you something here, which is very interesting. The verse started by saying, Alif la mura. Then it says, Kitabun uhtimat ayatuhu. Thumma fusilat min ladun hakimin khabir. Alif la mura, which we all know is the letters, alphabet in the Quran. 
Just like Arabic language contains alphabet. Just like English language contains alphabet. A stupid person will ask you, what does Alif, Lam, Ra means? It's just like asking me, what does A, B, C, D means? What do you want to expect me to say? They are just alphabets. What else? They are letters. What else? What do you want God to give you from that? When he has given you Al-Kitab, which is a clarification for all things already, what else do you want him to tell you? That's why he says, Tarsin, and he says, Tilka ayatul Quran wa kitab al mubin. They are ayat, they are signs. When we say ayah, it can be a symbol, it can be a sign, it can be a miracle, it can be a verse, it can be a wonder, and so on. In Arabic, one word can have 10 to 15 meanings. You decide the meaning based on the context. So when God says, Alif, Lam, Ra, then he says, Kitabun, because you use letters and alphabets to write a book. There is no way a book can exist if it doesn't have letters and alphabet in them being written. Do you see the point? So God says, Kitabun uhkimat ayatuhu. The Kitabun here, the ayatuhu, the masculine pronoun, the domir is here, the masculine pronoun is attributed to the Kitabun. You see here, the uhkimat here, it's a feminine attribute attributing to the ayat, the verses. Because whenever the word ayatu or ayati is mentioned in the Quran, it's a feminine attribute. You see it here. So the feminine attribute goes with the feminine, you know, uh, word next to it to, to give you the notion. But the who used at the end of ayat is to denote the kitab. So the kitab, inside the kitab, you have ayat, and the ayat are attributed with a feminine attribute. Just like in chapter 45, verse 6, God says, Tilika ayatullahi natuluha alayka bilhaq. God says, Tilika ayatullahi natuluha. The ha denotes a feminine attribute. That is a feminine pronoun. So that you know it is referencing to the verses of the Quran. So here he says, Kitabun uhkimat ayatuhu. Then he says, Thumma fusilat milladun hakimin khabir. So what does he mean? He says, a book whose verses have been mastered, whose verses has been made precise, whose verses have been perfected, whose verses, what else do you need? Ukimat. <laughs> it comes from the word hakima. Huh? Or in chapter 3 verse 7, we have muhkamat. It comes from the same root word. So it has been made precise. It has been made mastered. It, it is based on wisdom. So it's precise. It is accurate. It is perfected. It is mastered. The verses of God we are talking about, not the verses of Sahih Bukhari. Then it says, Thumma fusilat. Then elaborated, or we can say detailed. By who? Milladun from Hakimin Khabir. Coming from the wise and what? Cognizant, which is God. So he has already perfected his book and then detailed it. But do you know the ones who are telling you, Ahi, you cannot understand the Quran because it's not detailed? They are the mushriks and the ignorant ones out there. Because every knowledgeable person knows, according to chapter 41, verse 3, it has been detailed. Kitabun fusilat ayatu Quran and Arabian li kaumi yalamun. You see here. Then he says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُسَرِّفُ لَآيَاتِ وَلِيَكُولُوا دَرَسْتَ وَلُنُبَيِّنَهُ لِكَوْمِ يَعْلَبُونَ Chapter 6, verse 105. So, bayan has been done by God. Fusilat has been done by God. It is only a foolish mushrik who will tell you, No, Ahi, the book doesn't detail anything. Okay, okay, okay. Show me where it says five salat. Are you a fool? If it doesn't say five salat, who gave it to you? Show me how many rakat you do in your salat. If he doesn't say the rakat in the Quran, then who give you? God? Or Imam Bukhari? Chapter 34, verse 6. God says, وَيَرَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُ الْإِلْمَ Then he says, لَذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ then he says, Wayadi ila siratin azizul hamid. God says, Wayara alazina utul al ilma. God says, and those who have been given the knowledge, we can see that al ilma is a marifa, a datal tarif. Because the Quran is based on knowledge. 
The book is based on knowledge. Chapter 7 verse 52. Walakadi jinahum bikitaben fasalnahu ala ilm. You see, the book is based on knowledge. So when God has finally given you the knowledge, this is what he says. And those who have been given the knowledge will see, Yara, they will see. Lazi unzila ilayka that what has been revealed to you, Muhammad, min rabbika from your Lord, who will hack it is the truth. Then it says, Wayadi ila siratan azizil hamid. And this same book guides to the path of the Almighty, the, the, the praiseworthy. That same book, if you have been given the knowledge. So it is only somebody who has not been given their knowledge of the Quran. They are telling you the gibberish and the jumbles of hearsays every time. Do you see? Good. So now we go on. I take you to Quran chapter 6 verse 114. And I read to 115 to summarize this issue. Then I tell you some few things. Then I end this program. Inshallah. So now if I take you to Quran chapter 6 verse 114 to 115. It says, Ava gayri lahi abtagi hakaman wa huwa allazi anzala ilaykum al-kitaba mufassala wa allazina ataynahum al-kitaba ya'lamuna annahu munazzalun min rabbika bilhaq fala takunanna min al-mumtarin. Verse 115, then it says, Wa tammatu kalimati rabbika sidikan wa adlan. Then it says, La mubaddila li kalimatihi wa huwa samiru alim. What is the verse saying? He says, shall I seek other than God as a judge? Or shall I seek a judge other than God? While he is the one who has revealed to you Al-Kitab Mufassala, meaning explained in detail, elaborated. Shall I seek a judge? Somebody to judge for me in my deen and tell me this and that? Unless I'm a fool. If I do that, I'll be a fool. To actually allow somebody outside the context of the book of God to tell me this, uh, that, or that. You understand? Then God says, And those whom we have given the Al-Kitab, they know that it has been revealed from your Lord with the truth or in truth. So do not be among the doubters. Then verse 115 says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ سِدِكًا وَعَدْلًا لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ The word of your Lord, when we say kalimatu, hmm? kalimatu, God used the word tammat, which is tamam. In Arabic, when they say tamam, it means complete, or it means that is sufficient, enough, complete. Huh? So, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ Sidikan wa adlan, and we know the kalimatu, which are the verses of God we have in the Quran. Quran chapter 10, verse 37 clearly tell you, Wama kana haza al Quran an yuftara min duni lahi wa lakin tazdik al lazi bayna yadayl wa tafsil al kitab la rayba fi min rabbi al alamin. So the Quran is the word of God. So now God is telling you, Watamat kalimatu rabbika, sidikan wa adlan. When we say sidikan, it means in honesty, truthfully, something which is truthfully or honest. So Sidikan wa Adlan, and then just it is it is a book full of justice. Right? Then he says, La mubaddila li kalimati. There is no alteration to his words. Wahu was Samiun Alim, and he is the hearing, the what? Knowledgeable or erudite, or we know somebody who is, you know, knowledgeable, profound in knowledge, ominous. So now we see these two verses I just quoted. I only have to seek God as a judgment, source of judgment, because he has given me a book which has the tafsil, kulla shayin. This same God has completed the book, his words in the Quran for me. So I don't need an outside, outside context to understand the Quran. You understand? Good. Now I'm getting to the main interesting part that we can understand this notion. So why did I say there's a barrier between... Uh, the Quran, understanding the Quran and what God is saying. The barrier is the language. So even the prophet himself, this is what God told him in chapter 44 verse 58. God told the prophet, God says, 
We have only made it easy in your language or in your tongue. Perhaps they will take heed or they will be mindful or they will what? Remember. You see, that is why God made it easy. So Quran chapter 14 verse 4 clearly tells us why God does that to the messengers. Then he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانٍ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ and we do not send a messenger except in the language of his people in order to clarify for them. It doesn't mean the messenger is clarifying the book already, which is clarified. What you are doing is clarifying in the language of your people. Because the Quran only came in Arabic language. So let's say even the Arabians, they have different dialects. So even if Prophet Muhammad, let's assume people say it comes from the Quraysh tribe. The Quraysh tribe, the Arabic of the Quran is not the Arabic of the Quraishis. This Arabic is Lisanun Arabiyun Mubin. It's different from the Arab they are, Arabic languages they are speaking. No Arabic language on earth, uh, Arabic country on earth can boast and say that the Quran, Arabic, Arabic language in the Quran belongs to them. It's a lie. Not even Saudi can say the Arabic language in the Quran belongs to them. It's a lie. It comes from God. It is not from a human being. And I'm going to answer that right now. So Quran chapter 16 verse 103. What a messenger, before I go to that, what a messenger does is, in the language of his own people. So let's say, let's assume I understand the Quran. I've been taught by God. And I'm talking to somebody from Ghana. And I want to explain something to him or clarify something. To him. I can only clarify in our own language so that he get to understand the equivalence of what God was saying in Arabic. But the reason why I can explain to him in a different language, meaning because I've already gotten the explanation from God, now I can tell him. So for people who are based in the Western countries, the asylum seekers and whatever have you, you usually have translators who are mediators, uh, interpreters. So you, they, you come, maybe you don't speak English, then you, you will have a, a translator or somebody who has to interpret what you're saying. Then when the police or the immigration say something, maybe in English, the interpreter, what he does is he will twist it or convert it into your own language and tell you precisely the same thing that the police are telling you or immigration are telling you. It doesn't mean he will add his own words or his views or points. No, he will just translate it and then tell you precisely. And this is what I do with the Quran. So when people don't understand, they will think, oh, what is he doing? Is he now explaining the verses of God? No. It has already been explained. Mine is just to clarify for you in the English language you are listening to. That's the difference there. So here, <clears throat> here, chapter 16, verse 103, he says, Then he says, Then he says, God says, we certainly know that they are saying or they say it is only a human who is teaching him. Then God says, Lisanun, the tongue or the language, lazy by which Yulhiduna, meaning they equivocate. It comes from the word Lahada or Lahida, meaning to equivocate. You understand? To or to deviate in the such a way that. Uh, your intentions are not accurate. Right? Ilayhi ajamihun. And the ones, the, 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 the language or the tongue by which they equivocate hmm, about it or concerning it or to it is what? Ajamihun, which is foreign. When we say ajamihun, something foreign other than Arabic language. Then God says, Wahaza lisanun arabiyun mubin. So you see the compar comparison there. This is a comparison here. Because they thought they are speaking something called Arabic. While God made a comparison and said, This, this is Lisanun Arabiyun Mubiyin. So this is a clear Arabic language. So it tells you, to deal with the Quran, we need clarity of the word Arabic language. So now language plays a role here in understanding the Quran. Because obviously it wasn't re revealed in French language, neither in Finnish language, neither in Ghana language, neither in American language. It is revealed in Arabic language. And he never says the Arabic of the Saudis or Arabic of Syria or Iraq. 
or you know uh, uh, how do you say uh, Libya or anything no because these are different dialects you understand so now if I take you to Quran chapter uh, uh, Quran chapter 26 verse 195 it used the same uh, instance where it says Bilisan in Arabian Mubi now the difference here people should understand here, here is if you go to Quran chapter 26 verse 195 where it says Bilisanin Arabian Mubi it used something we call Jarun right this Jarun is usually you see Kesra to, to denote a noun or what God is telling you in the Quran and this gives actually uh, the, the notion of and how the grammar aspect work grammatical aspect works if you go to chapter 16 verse 103 it used Rafun Rafun is usually to use the Dhamma, right? So you see, Lisanun Arabiyun Mubin. It doesn't mean it's different from the one in chapter 26, verse 195. It's just the same thing, but the structure of the grammar is what changed. So nothing different about that. So Quran chapter 27, verse 1, it says, Passing Tilka Ayatul Qurani, then it says, Wakitabin Mubin. So God is now telling you, you just read something. You said Tasin, which are letters, alphabets in the Quran or in the Arabic language. So then he told you Tilika. When we say Tilika, they are these. You are just reading some letters. So he just you just mentioned some letters. Then he said these. Ayatun. Ayatun Qurani. So these are signs or symbols of the word Quran. Because those symbols, these are the ones you see in the Quran. Alif Lamim, Alif Lamra, Yasin, Tasin. You understand? This doesn't have any special meaning. Where somebody will say, Oh, there is a special meaning. Allah Alam. What? God says He has given you the book. Wanazanna alayka al kitaba tibiyana al shayin. A book which is to serve as a clarification for all things. Did he say illa? No. So he has given you the book. It's a clarification for all things concerning your deen as a Muslim. Because he told you in chapter 5 verse 3. Al-yawma akamautu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum nimati wa raditu lakum islam dina. This day or today I have completed your religion for you. Right? And I have approved Islam as a, uh, 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 your religion as Islam as a religion for you. He has already completed his favors upon you. He has completed his religion for you. And he has approved Islam as a religion for you. So if he gives you a book, what do you expect? He has to give you a book which is a clarification for all things. Because he has already completed everything. I give an example. This mobile phone. As soon as the manufacturer finished completing the phone, he can now give you a manual to explain everything in the phone. That's how it works. So similarly, since God has completed your religion, he has given you the al-kitab. To serve as a clarification for all things. A fool will ask you, show me where he, show, he tells me how to use my television. Are you a fool? Is God who created a television for you? Don't you know the Philips company or Sony company to tell you how to use your own television? <laughs> now, I'm almost coming to an end. So this is where the relevance of studying what we call Ihirab comes in. When we say Ihirab... You know to know Lugga, meaning you have to know the structure of the Arabic language. And when I'm saying Ihirab, please don't waste your time to go and learn MSE, Modern Standard Arabic. Try your best to learn what we call Fusha, or you try to understand. Now, the notion of learning, look, there's a difference between speaking and understanding. Try your best to understand Arabic. Don't waste your time to go and speak Arabic. Guess what? Because we have different dialects in Arabic. So if you are going to learn how to speak Arabic, don't waste your time Say you are going to learn Fusha to go and speak to people. Brother, you will be wasting your time. Because most of the Arabians out there don't speak Fusha. What they speak is the modern standard and their own dialects. So you mention a word in Fusha they don't even know. I'm serious. L Devote your time to understand what God is saying, which is the classical, like classic Arabic, which is the Quran, right? And there is a difference on a scholarly perspective. I tell you one thing. I'm based in Finland, right? I live in the south. 
Now in this south, there is something we call Mure. Mure means a dialect. The dialect is being spoken only in the southern part of Finland. When you move to the north, whatever you know how to speak it, whatever Mure dialect you know, it changes the moment you move to the north of Finland. It changes. When you go there, you are going to start afresh. You are going to learn it new again. Because they are not using your dialect, the ones you are using in the south. So if you tell me you are going to learn how to speak Arabic, without staying with the Arabians, you can't get it precise. Because if you speak the written Arabic to any a Dick, Tom, and Harry Arabian or a layman, he wouldn't understand what you mean. He would not get it, especially if he's not educated. It's only the educated ones who know what you actually meant by your statements. So this is how language works. You are going in for the written language, and Quran is the lesson on Arabian Mubin. So make effort to understand the Arabic language of the Quran. And this is how it goes. There is something we call Nahu. Nahu is a syntax. And what is a syntax? Every language has it. Syntax. It is the grammatical arrangement of words in sentences. This is a linguistical aspect. And that is a language. Now, when you come to the Arabic language, this Nahu, which is the syntax, the grammatical arrangement of words in, in the sentences you find in Arabic, there is something Arabians deal with. The rule. And this rule is what we call the Arabic speech. This Arabic speech is classified into what? Three parts. We have the ism, ism, that is the noun, and then we have the feel, which is the verb, and then we have the what? Harf, or you can say huruf, which is the particles or the particle. Now, these three things, you can see the difference with English language. Yes, the structure of the Arabic language has difference in English language. I can tell you for a fact. You understand? They have difference. For instance, in English, you can say, I am going to school. In Arabic, they don't have that structure. So unless you, if you actually know how the verb and nouns work, then you can actually translate it in that sense. So for instance, if I say, Zahaba il al -bayt, he goes to the house. I can use the same sentence, Zahaba il al -bayt, and I'll use it to mean he is going to the house. The same sentence, it doesn't change again in Arabic. I'll use the same thing to translate and say he is going to the house. So I'll use the going, the same structure of the sentence I use, he is going to the house. I'll use it the same one to use, he goes to the house. Zahaba il al -bayt. Zahaba il al -bayt. But then it will mean he is going to the house or he goes to the house. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, I think I touched on my mistake. Okay, so my time is taken. I'm, I'll, I'll bring this to an end before the family comes home. Yeah, uh -huh. so then if you are curious enough to understand how the linguistical aspect of the Quran works, I advise you make make have the, some curiosity to learn Arabic, even online. You can go online to learn the structures. But then I'm going to give you some of the highlights of what you need to be interested in in order to come by understanding the Quran in the highest level. So you have to deal with Nahu, which is the syntax, and which is the grammatical arrangement of words, how words are used in sentences. Right? So based on this, you need to know the three rule. The three rule is the Arabic speech, which is classified into three parts. So we have the ism, which is the noun, and we have the verb, and we have the harf, which is the particles. Right? Now, after knowing this three structure, have the curiosity to know how the vocabulary works, which is the word maf mafradat. This mafradat, which is a language user's knowledge of words. Be, be familiar, familiar yourself with the words. Start, start going through the vocabulary of Arabic words. Right? Take a bunch. You can anytime take about 10 words, put them on the table. Now, when you put them on the table, Try to use to 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 this to, to to like remove the affix and the prefix. Remove everything. The affixes. Remove everything. Get it to become three-letter word, which is the, the trilateral root. We, we can say the usul or the root word of every word you found in Arabic. Try to remove every affixes. Huh? The affixes. Remove them. So I will tell you, for example, the word madrasa. Madrasa, it, it can mean 
uh, a place of studying or we can mean we can mean a school or it can mean uh, uh, a place of study we can say madrasa right now madrasa this has it has the affix the prefix and the affix on it so what you need to do is you remove all the affixes you can remove the ma and you remove the ta madrasat yeah then it's left with the trilateral roots so it become da ra sa this da ra sa will help you to understand how the arabic speech works which is divided into the noun the verb and the word particle so when you strip the word naked it will left with the trilateral roots and this is how unique the arabic language is so this trilateral roots will now help you to be acquainted with words to familiarize with how words become get their prefix and the affix on them so what you need to do is you have to be acquainted with the word mafradat which is the vocabulary which is the language uh, uh, language uses knowledge of words meaning the user must have the knowledge of the words you have to familiarize with the words after you have familiarized for the words try to know the root word the usul of the words and this usul is what linguistically is the form of a word after all the affixes are removed you have to strip it naked then it will become a trilateral root word meaning involving three letters only then after that after getting all the words try to know whether the word is a muzakkar meaning a what a masculine or it is what muannath meaning a feminine <laughs> and this is very very interesting in arabic language because in arabic they don't have the word it you either have masculine or feminine but in english we even have it separately in arabic they don't have that so it's either something is masculine or something is what feminine that's how it works in arabic do you see how it goes good so now when you are dealing with such words you start to know start to differentiate like the word bite the word bite is a feminine word you see with the word kitab is a what masculine word and it's a noun so bite is a house but it's feminine kitab is a noun but it's masculine now how to know that always check the end the last letter which appears if it has the tau marbut it has tau based on how it is written you get to know this is a feminine word so in the feminine attributes they usually have the tau marbut that is the the something you write, write like o with the two horns right so you need to understand this structure and i'm only giving these hints when you want to approach the quran because arabic language is a barrier and this is what most of the scholars will use to bully you with it and say no come on you don't know and i'm telling you don't waste your time speaking arabic rather waste your time to understand arabic that is the bonus then after you have understood how the muzakkar works which is the masculine it is a gender that refers chiefly but not exclusively to males or to objects classified as male so somebody will say why do you call god huwa it doesn't mean god is a man <laughs> neither does it mean he's a male but this is how the language works so that is why we use the masculine attribute for god because his name doesn't have a uh, elata we don't say elata he doesn't have the tau marbut at the end for us to even classify him as a female this is how when people don't understand the grammatical rules of a language they start beating around the bush and then making up things out of ignorance do you see how it works uh -huh. so you need to know masculine when we say muzakkar it is a gender that refers chiefly chiefly but not exclusively to males or to objects classified as what male then it goes feminine that is muannath this muannath is a gender that refers chiefly but not exclusively to females or to objects classified as female we can know house is an object house is not a, a, a human being but why is it that we are using a feminine attribute to refer to houses do you understand this point how is it that we are talking about ayat or ayat the verses of god why is it that we are using a feminine attribute to address to the verses that is how the grammatical aspect of the language works and remember i keep telling you wala takhafu ma laysa lak bihi 
Try to have knowledge in certain things. And don't go arguing about something you don't know. Do you see how it works? <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Just <coughs> Yes. Uh, okay. Let me move on. So now, this is the first thing. You have to know the Nahu, which is the syntax. Write it down. Syntax. That comes under Ihrab or Lugga to know the language. So then you, from the, from the syntax, try to know the rules, the three parts of the Arabic speech, which is the ism, the feel, and the what? Harf. Or you can say huruf, which is the particles. So we have the ism, which is the noun, and we have the feel, which is the verb. Then we have the particle, which is the harf. Yeah, right? When we say the harf, there are some things you connect, like we say ila, an, uh, min, or you, you bring the notion of uh, saying, uh, let's say, uh, uh, len, uh, those kind of little, little words you find in the Quran, which is connected, helps you to connect nouns and verbs and other things. Try to know that because those, those are the ones which help you to, to actually how, know how the verse starts and the preposition. I will, okay, I'll use the word preposition. They help you to understand how the preposition work in Arabic. Then again, from that, we go what we call marifa. This marifa in English is what we call adult tarif. We call it definite article. What is a definite article? It's a determiner. As the, the T-H-E you use in English. That indicates specificity of a reference or of reference. So, for instance, you open the Quran, you see the word al-kitab. It tells you this is marifa. It's a definite word. So the meaning shouldn't be changed. The meaning has to be precise based on the context you are reading. It has to be precise. You can't just say, oh, let me choose this meaning and put it there. No, it doesn't work that way because it's specified. It's just like when I'm talking to you and I say the boy. If you don't know the boy, you say which boy. But if you know the boy, we move on with the conversation. We don't need to go and explain who is the boy. That's how the marifa works, right? Then we have what we call the adatul nakra, which is the nakra is indefinite article. You need to know how it is indefinite. It's just like in English, we say a boy. Or we say boy without putting the word there. You understand? So there's a difference there. The nakra and the marifa. If you know how this works, it helps you to understand how the grammatical rules of the language works in the Quran as well. Yeah, uh, brother Shahid, that's true. Yes, some people might understand my notion, but let them keep up. Anyways, then we have the, what we call the Mufrad. Mufrad is like, in English we say singular. Now, what is singular? The form of a word that is used to denote a what? A single tone. Or huh? a singularity. Now, when you know how singular words are used in the Quran... For instance, uh, when we say the word kitab, it's a singular word. It's a noun. Kitab means a book. But when we say kutub, kutub, you understand? It becomes books or we can say writings. So kutub or kutub. Now we are talking about books. You understand? So if you, you need to learn how the, the jumla, uh, sorry, the jam, jamu works and the mufrad also works. That is singular and plural. So the singular is a form of a word that is used to denote a single tone. Then the plural, jamu'un, is the form of a word that is used to denote more than one thing. Meaning you are talking about two, three, four, five, six, seven things. But usually, if you have to deal with two things, I will come to that, which is we are dealing with the word we call munatha. Uh, 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 and that has to do with uh, the dual. Dual of an uh, of a noun of an ism. If you're dealing with two things, right? So I'll come to that. Like like saying kitabain. You understand kitabain, or you you use the word by saying uh, 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 like rajilain, uh, rajilain. So two two men, or you use kitabain two books like that. 
So then you need to know how the singular and the plural works in Arabic. Just you can find the time, write it down, find the rules, learn it. If you know all this structure, you can start getting acquainted with the grammatical aspect of the Quran in case somebody is translating something wrong or lying to you in the translation. You find it out. Then now we come to the noun, which is the ism. And now, just like you understand in English language, but when it comes to the Arabic, this can be used a bit differently. Somehow, not necessarily 100% different, but somehow. So a content word that can be used to refer to a person, place, thing, quality, or action. You understand? So the, this context word with ism, the noun, can be referred as, especially in Arabic, it can be used, used to refer to an action. And sometimes they use the word as the masdar. So uh, you, you, you find it out when you try to understand how the, the grammar works. So then we have the domir, which is the pronoun. A function word that is used in place of a noun or a noun phrase. So just like if I mention the word kitab, if you whenever you see the word who, uh, who comes after with the verb next to it, it denotes the kitab because the kitab is a masculine word. So the who would denote the damir, the pronoun aspect of, of, of that. Then again, if we talk about entities, the human being or something, for instance, we have Anna, which is like me or I. Then we have anta, we have hua, we have hia, we have whom, we have huma, we have hunna. Just, these are pronouns where you get to understand the subject being discussed and who, what God is talking about. That will help you to actually understand the grammatical aspect of the Quran as well. Then we have the feel, which is the verb, a word class that denotes an action, occurrence, or state of existence. Now, this is where root words are usually formed. So you have to deal with the past, present, and future, which is the... Uh, 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 how do you spell it? We have the Madi, which is the uh, past tense. Then we have the Mawjud, which is the present. Then we are dealing with the future and so on. Then we have the what? What we call the Fa'il. Fa'il, it comes under the, the, the verb and normally goes with a noun. So this verb, Fa'il, for instance, the word Kataba is a verb. It means write. Right, kataba, right. But then, if I say katib, katib, because of the alif madda in between uh, the letters that comes in the middle, the word katib now becomes a dua verb. So it is the dua of the word kataba. So that becomes katib, somebody who writes, a writer. You understand? So if you understand this structure, also it makes it easy. So it's a person who act and get things done according to the Arabic language. So you can know the alif madda, which comes in between. Then we have the adverb, which is the third of the word class that qualifies verbs or clauses. Then it goes again like having the word, I am sitting on a chair, or I am, you know, going to school. Just the way prepositions are used in between. Then you have the adjective, you can say sifa, but in Arabic, usually these are only used in exceptional cases. But to understand the Arabic language itself, the Arabic speech contains three parts, which is the noun, the verb, and the particles, right? That is the harf. But when it comes to adverb, adjective, they can be used as well, but they have exceptional cases where you can actually use to pinpoint. Because guess what? You are translating Arabic to another language. So you have to follow the Arabic language rules, and then you have to follow the language you are translating it to. Also, it is English. You have to follow the rules of English language when you are translating. So this is why sometimes it can be interchangeable when you have to use words like adverb and adjective. Then we go to the particle, which is the harf, or in plural form particles, we can say huruf, which is a function word that combines with a noun or pronoun or noun phrase to form a prepositional phrase that can have an adverbial or adjectival relation to some other word. So then, under that, we have the uh, rafun, which is the elevation of a noun with dhumma. We have the nasbun. Then we have the jawrun, which is normally you find the dummatain, un, then you have the an, you have the in. You understand? You need to understand the difference because when it is a feminine attribute, you have what? Tun, you have tan, and you have tin, which is a feminine. So usually at the end, you will find out that the word has the ta or ta marbut to denote the u, a, 
A to denote that this is a feminine attribute. For, for example, the word salata or salati or salatu, it is a feminine word and it is a noun. So now this will help you to understand if it falls under the, the rafun, nazbun or jarun. So this all comes under the, uh, the, the grammatical rules of the Arabic language that person needs to actually devote his time if he wants to know how the grammar works. Then we have the particles. We have the eight particles of the jar. Like the word fee, that you say is uh, fill bites in the house. Uh, fee. Uh, so when you have the word an, just like God says, you have uh, al kalima an mawadi. Chapter 4, verse 46. When the Jews did what, what they do is they distort the words or the word from its what positions or places. So you need to understand all these uh, particles of the jar, which is the ila, and then we have ala, we have ka, that just like God says kel and am. Some people are just like livestock. Then we have the li, uh, that is, God says, akimi salati li dilu ki shams ila gasaki lay. So li, then we have the min, then where God says, wa min anai layl, fatahajadu bihi, it goes like that. Or min al layl, then it goes. So then we have B, just like we say, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. We have B. So these are the eight particles of Jar. Then we have the ten particles of the Nazm. We have the An, that is the Alif and the Noon. Then we have the Lan, never to start a statement. We have the Kai, just like God says, Kai la dunatan bayna agniya minkum. Then he says, Hatta, then he says, until, which is to come to actually give you the. the uh, before or after a nasbun to actually help you to understand how it works. Then it goes on. Then we have fa, we have wa, we have au, we have la, la like that isn't. Then we have kai la. So then we have seven particles of the rough. Then we have fa'il, we have non fa'il. Then we have muktada. Then we have uh, jabaru. Then we have is. Then we have that is the ism of kana. For instance, you find in the Quran, God says, Inna Allah kana uh, alimun. Khabir, for instance, or in Allah kana, it used the kana, so you can see that it's a noun. Allah is a proper noun, which is the name of God. Then after it, exactly, you see the word kana. So the kana here denotes this, uh, is part also the particles of the rough, rough on to let you understand that how the grammatical aspect work. Then we have the dual of a noun, which is what muthanna, the muthanna of an ism. A grammatical number category referring to two items or units as opposed to one item or more than two items. Just like the word kitab, then we can say kitabai or kitabani. So when you mention like that, people will know you are talking about two things, right? Or you say isnaini, isnain, two things. Or you say marrataini, like it goes in the instance like that. Then, which is the word superlative aspect of the arabic language for instance the word kabir if you want to put it in the superlative form you say akbar if you want to put it in the highest form you say al akbar you understand so the the, the akbar the alif there denotes a superlative form which is what the highest level or degree attainable the highest stage of development the superlative form of an adjective or adverb so in arabic we have uh higher we have Hassan, then it says Ahsan. You see, it goes like that. Then we have uh, notions of understanding how words work from the word Hamd or Hamid or Hamd. We can say Ahmad. You understand? You put it in the superlative form. Then you say Al Ahmad. So then you, that's the highest level. So it goes like that if you understand how it works also in Arabic and if you have curiosity enough you need to learn this and it will help you so then we go to something we call maudu after learning all the structures you go to what we call maudu maudu can be a subject or what a topic what is the maudu the thing or area being discussed that becomes a subject so when you take the Quran if God says I came with salat it becomes a subject so then you have to delve into deeper to see the explanation and clarification that God has done in order to understand the subject. Then we have a what? Jumula. Jumula is a clause or sentence, which is a string of words satisfying the grammatical rules of a language. So if you are dealing with Arabic language, whenever you form a what? Jumula, a sentence, you have to meet the grammatical rules of the Arabic language. Remember, it is a written language. Good. So then we have what we call synonym, which is a muradif. 
Now, when you are dealing with the muradif, it means you are already acquainted with words, and the words have multiple, you know, synonyms. Now, so when you have two words that can be interchanged in a context, are said to be synonyms relative to that context. You understand? So, in the same context, I can be talking about the kitab, then I'll take kitab out and I say the hadith, meaning I'm still talking about the same thing. And I can take the hadith out and I put the, the kitab there. And it still will make sense in that verse. So if they are relative based on the Quran, if the context allow it, then we fit it in there. Then we have the, what we call tasrif. Tasrif is very, very essential. After learning the words in Arabic and you want to form a sentence, you need to know what a tasrif is. And that is what conjugation in English language. A class of verbs having the same inflectional what forms the act of making or becoming a single unit you can take a verb and then you take a pronoun you join it you take a noun you take a verb you join it then you put a noun at the end you make a sentence you put your preposition you make a sentence then it makes sense so that is the three conjugation the inflection of also verbs then we have what we call siyak al-kalam or siyak, which is a context. What is a context? A discourse that surrounds a language unit and helps to determine its interpretation. You have to know the siyak al-kalam when you are dealing with Arabic language. It is very, very important. And every language, as a matter of fact, but basically when you are dealing with the Quran, deal with the context as well. Yes. Then we have what we call kamus. Now, kamus should be the last thing you go to. That is a dictionary. If you don't understand Arabic, try to know the structure of the Arabic first before you de even deal with the dictionary because it's dangerous. And when I mean dictionary, I'm talking about people who go to lexicons, right? So a reference book containing an alphabetical list of words with information about the words, the them. So what you need to do is, before you approach a dictionary, make sure you know the basics and the roots of the language, the structure of the language, before you can depend on a dictionary. Yes, I'm, I'm, I, I'm based in Finland, right? It took me two years to actually learn Finnish language, and I'm, I can tell you I'm above average, so I'm good speaking in uh, Finnish language. I can tell you for 100% fact, you the listener listening to me, if you don't understand and know the structure of Finnish language, and you come here and I give you the dictionary of Finnish language, you can never get it right. You miss up, you mess up the language, everything, if you depend on the dictionary, because you don't know the structure of the language. You don't know how words are used. So what baffles me is I've seen somebody, people who claim they follow the Quran, and what they do is they just do, go and take a dictionary and say, oh, this word means uh, a katala. It means uh, to kill, or it means what? To, to fight, okay? But he doesn't know how to use it. So if you go and use it in an instance where it will damage everything, and he will not understand what he is doing. So this is why I said the language is a barrier, meaning you have to, you don't have to 100% rely on translations because the translator might err. He's a human, remember. He might cause an error, he might make a mistake. So by you also learning, you will not be following translations blindly. You use your logic as well. So now we have the Kamus. That is a reference book containing an alphabetical list of words with information about the words. Then we have translation, what we call what? Tarjama. Now this Tarjama is my level of translation. It is a written communication in a second language having the same meaning as the written communication in a first language. So in order... To translate something from Arabic language, you have to understand and be acquainted with the context of Arabic language before you can bring it in English language. That is the tarjama, that is the translation. So now when it comes to translation, sometimes you will not have the exact word in the second language. It's impossible. I give an example. When you go to Quran, sorry, when you go to Quran chapter 4, there's a... Uh, Yes, Quran chapter 4, verse 176. For people who don't know, I'm going to give you an, an assignment. There is a word, word mentioned in Quran chapter 4, verse 176. The word says, Kalala. Now, this word, Kalala, it has a Tau Marbut at the end, and it says, Kalalati. Al -kalalati. This Kalala, you can never find the, the word, the same equivalent word in English language. It doesn't exist. The word, Kalala. You can translate it, but you can never find the same equivalent word in English language. So this is why some languages, they borrow words. 
they borrow it because they don't have that word in their language. So what they do, they will borrow, borrow it and form, formulate it in a new form. You understand? So if you are good at going to the root of languages, you find out that some words have been borrowed. You see how it works? Uh -huh. So this is why some names that uh, God has to mention even in the Quran like Maryam. If you go to the Aramaic, it's like that. Maryam, you go because it's borrowed and some names weren't in the Arabian culture. It has been borrowed. So then the Arabic will formulate its own way of pronouncing such a, a word or a noun from their own perspective. You understand? So this word Kalala in Arabic, chapter 4, verse 176, you can never find a direct meaning word in English. It doesn't exist. Yours is just to what? Interpret it so that it can make sense to the English reader. You see how it works? Aha. Uh -huh. So this word Kalala, let me break it down. Kalala has to do with somebody who doesn't have parents and who doesn't have kids. Somebody will say, oh, that, that is a single person. No, we don't describe that as single. If you are feeling a form and they ask you, are you married or single? That's where you write single. <laughs> but when it comes to Kalala, Kalala, we don't say you are single. We don't use that word. It's wrong in English to say single. You understand? So Kalala is somebody who doesn't have parents and he doesn't have kids. You see how Kalala is. So the word Kalala, you can never translate it directly in English to, to, with a direct word. It doesn't have it. You understand? So that becomes a challenge of a translator. So that is why the translator should make extra effort to know a written, the written communication in a second language having the same meaning as the written communication in a first, the first language. So by understanding what the first language entails, that is when you can break it down. Because that is the act of a translator. Yours is to break it down. For the second language to understand what is meant. And this is why God says in Quran chapter 14 verse 4. So that he can clarify for them. Because we have certain things people might not understand. So don't be surprised. Somebody could claim he's an Arabian but he doesn't understand the Quran. It doesn't necessarily mean the grammatical aspect of the Quran has to do with him. He grew up speaking a different dialect. He actually take up the study to learn the Quran. So there's a difference there. You approach an Arabian, you, you tell him what the Quran says, he's looking at you. He had never heard that word. So I give you another example. For instance, the word kinwan in the Quran, chapter 6, verse 99. Kinwan, it means the fruits of the dates. The date palm, the palm tree, the, the fruits of dates. Huh? In the Quran, it's called kinwan. That is the, 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 the nahal, the nahal or nahil, the tree, the fruits that you eat, which comes from the sleeves and you eat, according to the Quran, is skin one. Right? So only few parts, uh, some few parts of the Arabian world actually know this and they use it. But when you go out and tell every dictum and hurry, an Arabian, you tell him kin one, he will say, ah, no, la, 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 ah, hey, la, 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 la. He will tell you, tamar, tamar, tamar. Now, tamar. You tell it to say tamar because that is in the spoken language, that is what they have as dates. You understand? So they don't, most of them don't know even what the Quran say concerning that. And that's why also, for instance, the word garlic in Arabic, you can say thum, you can say fum, right? One is a foreign, uh, one is a spoken language and one is the written language, which actually the Quran has used. But then there's a difference in the pronunciation. So going back to the written work always helps you to understand things in a better proportion than only speaking. You get the point. Good. Then after that, uh, Salam, Brother Karim, Lewis, I see you. Salam, Brother Khalifa, Abdul Malik, I see you. Uh, Muktabul Hussain, I see you. Salam alaikum, Brother, long time. Uh -huh. So, before I come to an end, then we have the Nafi. Nafi is a negation in Arabic. The speech of acting, the, sp the speech act of negating something. So, for instance, in Arabic, they have the word la, they have len, they have ma, they have laysa, they have in la, then they have ma illa. So, if you know how it is used grammatically in the Quran, you can know how to negate, uh, how negative uh, statements are made in the Quran. Uh, for instance, when God says, la mubaddila li kalimati, that la denotes a negating. So, it is negating something, which means there is no alteration to his words. You see, so la. Then we have len. For instance, len has been used uh, in chapter 4, 
verse 129. When God says, Walan, he used Walan, Tastati u an tadilu bainan nisa. He says, You can never be able to act just, justly between the women. If you have multiple wives, there is no way on earth you can act just with your wives. It's impossible. You understand? So take your example of a kids. There is no way you can even have 100% just with your kids. <laughs> uh -huh. So that is the point here. So especially when it comes to the women and God is saying, dealing with women, he used the word lun. Now lun is stronger than using the word lum. You understand? So lum is the normal one, lum. Then we have lun. So when you use the word lun, like uh, to romanize the word L A N, Len, it means never. You see, so when God is uh, always negating a statement, had he used the word Len, ah, uh, then forget it. Forget it. It never happens. So then, if you know how the negation and, uh, works, then you know, uh, we say, for God, uh, God used the word Lisa. Lisa, or you can say Lasta if he's talking about you, a singular. Pronoun, just like God says in uh, Quran chapter six verse one hundred and fifty-nine, He says, "Inna lazina faraku dinahum wa kano shi'an lasta minhum fi shayin lasta minhum." It means you are not with them in anything. So lasta or laisa, when you are talking to about uh, someone, you can use laisa. Lasta if you are talking to somebody directly. So lasta minhum fi shayin. So we can see how the negation works, which we call in Arabic nafi. So nafi. If you understand the structure of how it works, it will make it easier when you are dealing with the Quran as well. Then we have what we have the Sa'il, that is a questioning. Now, in Arabic, you should understand, whenever there is a rule, whenever you see the word ma at the beginning of a sentence, and the sentence doesn't have illa, most of the times the ma denotes a question for a noun. That means what follow after it must be a noun. Ma when you see the word ma starts. But when you see the word maza, which means the question must entail a verb, a feel. So it has maza. When maza starts, it's going to ask about a verb. You understand? Which means the question is heading to a verb. But when the question starts with a ma, uh, then the question is heading to a noun. It's like you can ask somebody, ma anta. What are you? Ma anta. The anta is denoting a noun because you is a pronoun and it goes under a subject and that becomes somebody. You're talking about a human being or something. Ma anta. Then you say, you say, Maza yunfiku. Maza yunfiku. When they ask you, for instance, uh, let me quote the chapter, maybe two, verse 200 and. Uh, Yes, chapter 2, verse 219, where he talks about Hamel and Maiser. In the same verse, when you go down, he says, You understand? Whenever the word maza as a question comes in Arabic language, which is the grammatical rule, what follows has to be a verb. It doesn't have to be a noun. So, yumfikun is the act of spending or expending or dispersing, giving in charity. So, maza yumfiku. You understand? So if you understand the structure of the language and how the maza and the ma are used, you understand? You get to understand the structure of the language as well. Then we have the hal, hal, as a question. Whenever it starts hal, that is the how and the lamb. Hal, min shuraka ikum. You understand? Hal, min shuraka ikum. So let me see. Chapter 10. Verse 35. God asked the messenger to say, Kul hal min shuraka ikum man yadi ilal haq. So the word hal is a question when it's used in Arabic language. When you see the hal. Or then we use the word chapter 39 verse, uh, verse 9. When the alif starts. Alif uh, bil amza to wal, uh, wal fatah. When it says ah. Then it brings a word, like a, uh, a word, like uh, to denote, like talking about, uh, for instance, chapter 39, verse 9. It says, Amman huwa qanitun 
ana al-layli sajidan wa qa'iman then he says yahzaru al-akhirata then he says wa uh, wa yarju rahmata rabbi if you see the beginner of the verse it's a question so the word amman the alif there becomes a question based on the structure of the verse or the clause the jumla then you get to understand the notion of the question in arabic so when you come across the word ma maza then you have the the word uh, 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 uh then you have the word al and then you have you have the word uh for instance you can ask somebody like ila ila aina tazhab ila ila aina the word aina there used there can be a question because aina is where so it is used for questioning as well so you use ila aina tazhab you can say in our English, you can say, where are you going? Or you can say, you are not just going to take up what somebody said just like that, just because Brother Shaib is talking and you think he's knowledgeable. No, verify what I'm saying. Do your own research in order to you know, understand, increase yourself in knowledge. So then you pray to God to increase you in knowledge and you see the benefit of uh, this information I've given you. And actually, whatever you see me say is based on experience of something I have done uh, a lot of research and done and for people who know I've, I have a full translated Quran that I've translated and this is not based on whims on our desires or assumptions right I do it because I have been given the knowledge by God that's why I did it so ladies and gentlemen this is where I end for now and inshallah we keep in touch again inshallah maybe next week and let's see what happens so we honor Rabbi Zati Ammai Sifun Wassalamu Ala Al-Mursaleen Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Peace be upon you all and you can see Salim is sleeping, so peace.